another one, you bastard. Brought to you by Robotoys. More information in a moment. So I am recording this script with a sore throat. If I sound fucked at any point, I apologize, but there's not much I can do. I, I just hope I can probably do a better sound level than the last video. Anyway, enjoy. <laughs> When I review figures, I always like to shed light on the context behind them. No toy exists in a vacuum. Every figure has layers and layers of circumstance piled upon them. This is true of third party as well. To the uninitiated, third party may seem like a large collection of unrelated bootlegs swirling around in a whirlpool of copyright theft, but in actuality there's a story being told here. Within each scale, there's a change in sensibilities. And with that comes certain landmark releases. Fans Toys Quake Wave, the first true third party masterpiece attempt. And still a fantastic figure today in his own right. TFC Hercules, the first third-party combiner and a testament to what unofficial Transformers are capable of, even if he's oft forgotten next to some oh, of the more I'm recent right. Titans. Iron Factory, Turrets and Manacle, a release so successful they started an entire niche within a niche. Without these two, third-party legends wouldn't be what they are today. Mars Toys Thrust was at least half revolutionary, in the sense that the company did a 180 and ran off with everyone's money, also bankrupting the Unrustables team and putting Make Toys and Action Toys on thin ice. But in my eyes, there's one people don't often talk about, but remains just just as important. Many people complain that it's dated and needs to be redone, whilst many more have forgotten its existence entirely. But with a recent throwback being released, I think it's more important than ever to shed light on this magnificent release, so that we might have a base to compare to later down the line. Greetings Cybertronians, I'm Dr. Lockdown, and today's diagnosis pertains to Mastermind Creations reformatted R19 D Squad Cultor, or known more commonly as the Decepticon Justice Division's leader. Tarn. Space Jam released in November 1996 to critical acclaim and great financial success. A true masterpiece of animation as well as cinema in general, it took the world by storm. Its influence travelled far and wide until the IDW crew decided to copy the Monstars verbatim when they introduced the Decepticon Justice Division. At least that's how I think it went down. To be honest, I've never read that part of IDW. Yeah, I just bought this guy because I like the design. This is typically how I collect. Design based as opposed to character based. That said, I can definitely tell in vehicle mode some sacrifices have been made. Through the forbidden mystic arts known as the Google image search, you can pretty easily tell the original vehicle mode was a space tank. This is most certainly not that. Take off the gun and it's basically a space thing with treads. Not even the plow is facing the right way. If you go into this with a third party masterpiece mentality, you're going to be pissed off. But here Here's the thing, Kultur is not a masterpiece figure. Scaling aside, putting him more in the traditional leader category, he's just a more lightweight figure in general. Lighter plastic and no die cast. No way you're putting this next to MP fellows in terms of quality. Thing is though, when judging this fellow, you have to approach it from a different perspective. Mastermind Creations first release in the reformatted line, Terminus 6 Shotatron, released in 2013. Coincidentally, around the same time as Thrilling 30. Given the way this line was marketed, as well as how the aesthetics line up, these figures are meant to supplement existing chug toys from from Thrilling 30. This ideology carries over to the design as well. The vehicle mode carries across the same feel whilst not particularly being 100% accurate. Keeping this in mind, this is a sweet artillery vehicle mode. Yes, I would have loved him to have been a tank, but what we have here is fantastic regardless. If there's one thing MMC is known for, even with some of their more divisive moulds, it's the ability to imbue their figures with life through carefully crafted sculpt work and subtle paint choices. It may be a pretty simple design when you get down to the nitty gritty, but the way in which the robot details shine through works really well. Yes, the plow at the front is angled quote unquote wrong, but the detail on show is absolutely stunning with the piercing silver and intense pink. Doing the whole pink energon thing is is actually quite difficult, since if its inclusion reaches over saturation throughout the body, you end up with something more akin to that one show furries seem to go nuts over. Fortunately, they've shown just enough restraints, so that when it does make an appearance, it looks really cool. My favourite application would have to be the diagonal seam line on the left cannon. A detail from the comics, sure, but one that another company could have easily skipped by accident. Speaking of, yes, the cannons are a smidge wibbly. It uses a 5mm peg, which is fine and all, but rotating it can be a little annoying thanks to some of the tooling on the side of the chassis. It's doable, but you have to to pull it up a bit, which is annoying. The guns also have a little bit of rotation, but they get stopped by these rivets at the back here. I'd understand if it were for accuracy's sake, but in my admittedly limited research, I don't recall these ever being a feature on the character model. Ah well, it's still way more rotation than most chug scale tanks are afforded, even if this is less of a tank than it should be in the eyes of some. Besides, you quickly forget when you see how well painted these sections are. The gold highlight here is probably my favourite part of the whole turret. The asymmetrical aesthetic might seem weird at first, but once you relish in all the details, it cements itself as an iconic part of this package. 
Now, the body section itself isn't much to write home about, since it oft gets lost between the turret and the treads. I dig the way the knee details form spoiler-esque protrusions at the back here, and the main knee spikes folding in to cover the ratchet joints is a nice use of existing engineering architecture. But in general, this whole section isn't the main event. No, what draws your attention mostly are the treads, and hot damn, these are neat. Often Transformers, whether Hasbro sanctioned or otherwise, have trouble getting treads to work seamlessly, something which doesn't make sense, it's actually a pretty easy thing to do. Reviewers with more credibility than myself have pointed out that MMC consistently make everything look so effortless in comparison to other third-party companies, and the treads here are a great example of that. There aren't a billion panels that need to fold up an innumerable amount of times, just a few simple chunks that get the job done. Sure, there are no fake wheels at the bottom, but honestly, I can live without them. Now, there are annoyances with the tread transformations themselves, but that's something I'll get to later. Overall, this mode absolutely rocks. Is it in the masterpiece category? Well, Figuratively, yes, it is amazing, but in the colloquial sense, absolutely not. Scaling aside, it's not trying to be. It's trying to be the best third-party leader class figure it can be, and you know what? They did a bang-up job. It's well-painted, well-sculpted, and has a presence unlike many figures that triple his price point. But the secret to Kultor's brilliance doesn't lie in any specific design choices. Oh no. You ever heard the term, less is more? Well, when we get into the conversion, that becomes more true than ever. Except we have to take a quick detour, because today's video is brought to you by Robotoys. Robotoys is a top-ranked Australian toy seller, trusted by Aussies everywhere. Regardless of whether you're looking for mainline, selects, masterpiece, third-party, or knockoffs, they've got you covered. If you're a new customer, don't forget to use the code DRLOCK 10% off for a single-use 10% off coupon. Of course, Cult Tour here has been off the shelves for a few years now, but their MMC collection still has a few goodies for you to check out. Anywho, transformation time. Many transformations the third-party partakes in are... Well, a little ridiculous. Many conversions that go for accuracy and nothing else just ends up taking way too long with way too many finicky pieces. It's not that they're complex. Complex transformations can be very fun. It's just more often than not, third party goes down the route of MP52. The reason those transformations don't show up on this channel very much is because I just don't buy those figures. If I know the figure is going to be bad outright, well, why would I waste my money on it? And yes, I get it. A lot of people just want to leave it in one mode on the shelf, which would kind of bring up the argument of why we you just buy a non-transforming action figure, but that's beside the point. Point is, a lot of people want that because the transformation doesn't matter, but MMC doesn't follow that ideology. The transformation to them is just as important as everything else. It is a chug ideology, not a masterpiece one, and that is where Kultur's brilliance lies. First, you want to remove the weapon there. No, I'm not going to make that joke, I always do. The real first step is to bring the knee spikes up so that everything's a bit easier later. The feet are pegged in at the top here and they just untab. And the whole leg section just rotates down on these double hinges like so. You bring the tank treads out here on faux ratchets and you bring the feet forward like that. You basically bring these arms out just a little bit. Then you bring these sections up, rotate them around and they sit there. There's no locking mechanism. Yes, these are sliding rails my least favorite transformation system, but at least these are nice and chunky. I don't feel like these are going to break, whereas in a lot of cases, I feel like they are. And at least they're big, chunky, and smooth, unlike a previous example I looked at last week. Anywho, you want to bring the double hinge there and rotate the arm around and bring the fist into place. The reason the fist is facing this way in vehicle mode is so that it lines up against that cavity on the side of the thigh. You want to untab that from there and then bring it down like that. You've got a triple hinge system. System one, two, and three. Unfortunately, it's pretty sturdy, but the first hinge goes down into there, the second hinge goes up like that, so it zigzags like that, and the torso clips into place like so. Now, to access the back panel, you actually have to use the ab crunch down like that. Then you bring that section down, then you bring this section up as well, and I don't know why they have that there. It seems like a superfluous piece that accomplishes nothing, but oh well. From that point onwards, you need to just get up the face like that, bring this section down, and then you can bring these sections around. I guess maybe that piece is in there so that this part, when it covers up that, doesn't look bad. But still, it just seems a little bit superfluous. Bring up these sections, bring down the ab crunch, everything's into place with the legs separated, and we're good! Dead simple, almost on the simplicity of a Voyager, but hella fun. And that's not to say that Transformers can't be fun and complex. There are several examples that do that. In fact, let's bring in an example. Make toys Thunder Manus. Complex and fun. Plenty of steps, yes, but all the steps make sense. It's for the fun of the conversion. But most third-party figures don't follow this ideology, and that's why Coulter here is a breath of fresh air. It's not because he's simple. His simplicity is one of his strengths, sure, because they do the simplicity well. He's refreshing because he's fun. And I want more third-party figures 
to follow this ideology. Doesn't matter what level of the complexity scale you're at, just make fun transformations. You can do accuracy and fun, hell Masterpiece has been doing it for years. Before everything went wrong of course. But that's why I find Kultor to be a landmark piece, because he is one of the first examples where MMC really nailed that fun factor. And from here, a bunch of other third party companies started following in their footsteps. So it's a wonderful transformation that I find myself doing over and over again. It's great. Now I keep saying throughout this video that Kultor is not a masterpiece figure. The engineering follows this ideology, the alternate mode follows this ideology, the materials follow this ideology, pretty much everything does. However, upon first glance, if you weren't familiar with the source material, you'd likely be convinced that this robot was part of the masterpiece lineup. Hell, since I've never read through that arc in IDW, that was my first thought when checking out photos. Granted, at the time I didn't particularly have a good point of reference, but still, it's definitely a testament to the way this looks. Despite not having the same sort of materials you'd expect from an MP figure, it definitely has the presentation and exudes the presence of one. Kultor feels like a centerpiece, a hulking mass that towers over figures with its authority, even in the cases where he doesn't literally tower over them. The head sculpt is basically perfect, with wonderfully sharp eyes that pierce into your soul despite not actually having any paint on them. Now obviously, it's a representation of the Decepticon symbol, and although it may not seem like much, this was actually a ridiculously bold move for the time. Hell, even by today's standards, it's still somewhat shocking. Take a look at any third party figure and you'll quickly notice they never use bot and con symbols. I never really point out this fact, because it's something that most third party fans already know from a cursory glance, but obviously there's massive copyright f**kery going on with its inclusion, so unofficial companies always make the decision to omit such inclusions. Plus beyond that, face sculpts are allegedly the biggest thing Haztac can call out when trying to take down a company. I say allegedly, since all I have to go off is discussions with someone who's done work for MMC, and someone who's spoken with someone who's spoken with Make Toys. But the fact that Zeta always packs the head separately these days after the cease and desist conundrum provides evidence for such. Point is, when you take into consideration the trademark issues surrounding both accurate face sculpts and Decepticon symbols, the head sculpt goes from being f***ing awesome to downright insane. Even the marketing displays this masked face proud and true, hiding nothing, although to be fair that's probably for the best because without his mask, oh, oh dear. You can tell they've sacrificed his cheek structure for the sake of the mask sculpt, because this is just way too thin. Also has virtually no paint on it at all, save for the eyes, which oddly enough don't carry across to the mask. And before you ask, no, this isn't accurate to who Tarn actually is in the comics. This figure was manufactured before that revelation came out, so the designers kinda just made an exec. They of course got it wrong, following a red herring instead of the actual culprit. Iron Factory though, these guys got no excuse. Honestly though, I can't get too mad at this. At the end of the day, the mask itself looks lovely, so it was a worthy sacrifice. And whoa, Jesus, I just realized I spent 375 words talking about the context behind the head sculpt. What even is my review process anyway? Moving on, the torso design is also wonderful. Now that it's on full display, you can get a closer look at the prominent Energon line. The layering effect on these things is insane, and it's capped off with wonderful treads on the collarbone sections. Yes, they're obviously faux, but I honestly don't see how they could have done these normally. That said, eagle-eyed viewers familiar with the source material may notice that they don't go down nearly as far as they're supposed to. They'll then notice that the midriff isn't as angular as it should be, and that despite the shoulders being bigger than the comic panels, the overall bulk has been massively reduced. He's a bulky fella, sure, but this is not a hyper-accurate release. And this is where people start arguing over how dated this figure apparently is, because accuracy is in vogue at the moment, to the point where even Studio Series 86 is falling into many of its trappings. However, this is where I'd argue it doesn't show its shortcomings, but rather its strengths. As stated earlier, this isn't following the masterpiece ideology, but rather that of Chug. As such, it's sacrificing some of its accuracy for the sake of engineering and general aesthetic. And you know what? Coo f dose to the designers on this. Sure, they could have easily gone 100% accurate on this thing, but by pulling it back a bit, they're able to craft a masterful transformation and a robot mode that doesn't get stuck with bogus Kibli bits and faux appendages that make even me, someone typically okay with faux parts, scratch their head a bit. This is trying to evoke the feel of the character, and it does so to the T, as opposed to getting each minor detail down but glossing over the general point of the design, missing the forest for the trees, if you will. It's the same reason that I find Kingdom Rhinox a more enjoyable piece than that of Studio Series 86 Retgar. Or if you want something closer to this price range, why I prefer Planet X Cadmos much more to MP52 Starscream. Cadmos, oddly enough, makes similar proportional sacrifices to his robot mode, and I've gotta say, in both cases, it really pays off. Besides, this design is far better than what MMC had planned originally. Yeah, fun fact, this is actually the second iteration of the design. Sadly, I wasn't able to find many photos, since the designers appear to have scrubbed it from the internet. But from what we can see, yikes, this is infinitely better. Still, I do kinda wish they'd kept the claws from the original design, because as it stands, the arms 
cannons are a little bit plain. They get the job done, but it feels like something's missing when the cannons aren't plugged in. Considering the transformation, though, I can easily give it a pass. I do find the sculpting on the turret a bit confusing, though. It juts out of the arm in a really weird way, something which the Eris version improved on massively. And before you ask, yes, a review is eventually coming. It's just a matter of scheduling, but fear not, a solid date has been locked in. But back to this cannon. Considering this bit is what causes the rotation to get locked up anyway, I would have much preferred they redesign this entirely, especially considering they're deviating from the design somewhat as is. And I know a good chunk of 2021 collectors might be excited for this prospect, but sadly these are not coincidentally blast effect compatible. Coulter's holes are too big, and Eris's are too small. That said, given this fella predates Siege by about two years, I don't think we can get too angry. In fact, the only three parts that cause genuine frustration are the calf kibble, the shoulders, and the back spikes. Tackling the last one first, these spikes are immensely flimsy. I left mine on a desk one day, and when I got back, it had lightly toppled over, and the tip had snapped clean off. Don't know how it happened, but my shitty repair skills are always going to bug me. Just be careful with this bit. The plastic isn't quite as good as mainline, but most of it will get the job done. This bit, though, just use a bit of caution. Secondly, the shoulder kibble basically has nowhere to lock in. If memory serves me correct, and I have to use memory since my spreadsheet sadly doesn't go back that far, I received this around its second run. I think this puts it at about 2018, giving me roughly three years of owning him. In that time, these have held up pretty well, but given the nature of sliding rails, that just isn't going to work forever. And yes, despite typically not enjoying this type of joint, I think these work really well here, but they still can't hold the weight forever. Also, why are they using ball joints for the shoulders? Compared to how well done the rest of the hardware is, it just seems a little underdone. And you may be wondering why it's not such a good idea to be using ball joints on a figure of this size. Well, let me put it this way. You've got a big, beefy cannon here, and that cannon might not seem heavy, but over time, you want to start posing this guy and, oop, uh, take a look and, nope. And take a look and nope. And I haven't even been displaying this guy. This guy has been in storage for all this time. I guess I could always move it to this side and I could use that, but then eventually it would just do the same there. This is why it's good to use hinge joints or even better, ratchet joints in the shoulders on figures of this size. It's a big beefy boy. Different rules apply. Still, last but not least, I really dislike the way the back treads are handled. The hardware here gives Kultor the hypothetical ability to access double jointed knees, except whoopsies, the blasted tread blocks get in the way. They're not even properly integrated into the design, just kind of floating around the general area. They don't feel like they're even attached properly. Given the proportional design changes they've made anyway, a few more steps to make these properly integrate into the legs would have been greatly appreciated. Maybe have them fold in like SS86 slags, dino legs, or having them chill on the sides just further in would have worked much better. But as it stands, this feels like the one part where the simplicity goes just a little too far. Still, despite all of those issues, it's an absolutely fantastic robot mode. Putting aside the fact that this is basically just a souped up leader class figure. It's a piece that in any pose instantly gives you a feeling of authority. And good thing too because the articulation is pretty average. Don't get me wrong, there's a ton here. Ab crunches and double jointed elbows and ankles galore. Mostly with decent hardware. The only parts that really feel weird are the limited knees, which still get you 90 anyway, and the shoulders. Why did they use ball joints? It's just so out of place. On his own, he seems like a pretty well articulated figure. But here's the funny thing about 2016. I used to think it was almost an eternity ago, but it turns out it's saw the release of quite a few prolific figures. Ones that even to this day demolish half the shit we get from many of the big companies. That's not to diminish what Coulter is doing, but it does make his articulation just a little less special. But even with all that, the key ideology of this figure takes precedence over everything else and cements it as a landmark release for third party as a whole. MMC typically abides by one main philosophy, less is more, and Coulter here is the point where they finally hit their stride and refined everything. They had a bunch of hits previously, but after Coulter it was like a gasoline gun of absolute winners across both Ocular Max and Reformatted. At the end of the day, it's not just a display piece that commands respect over any other toys in your collection, although it does that too. It's also a fun toy, easy to convert back and forth, and ultimately it's the exact kind of third-party figure many people have been missing out on. So, how did the rest of the industry take the lessons learned from this monumentous occasion? <sighs> well, at least a few select companies followed in its footsteps. If you're a display-oriented collector who's looking at this video and getting pissed off that the chest is the wrong shape, this might not be the best release for you. Flame Toys is the far better option for that, although such comes with a hefty price tag and a somewhat lackluster transformation. Seriously, it's such a bad transformation you'd think he didn't have one at all. Beyond that, maybe Iron Factory is a good option. It matches the proportions much closer, if you're into that sort of thing. Although do be warned, the Ultimate suffers due to the combination gimmick. Anyone saying Iron Factory is Decepticon Justice 
Justice Division didn't make sacrifices is deluding themselves. However, if you're like me and love the engineering aspect of Transformers, and would rather the aesthetic take sacrifices for the sake of that and overall playability, then you're in luck, because Kultor does that. And in my eyes, as a result, he cements himself as the best Tarn on the market. No sirs, ma'ams, and otherwise, I don't think he needs an update. He may be flawed, but he's my Tarn. Forever more. Although that doesn't say much about the Rule 63 version, but alas, that's another story for another time. <laughs>